Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue à, à cette session à, à, qui est intitulée « Localiser les ODD dans votre communauté ». Dans la prochaine heure, nous allons partager des expériences de plusieurs villes et d'organismes communautaires dans l'utilisation des objectifs du développement durable comme cadre de planification locale et comme façon de planifier et d'organiser euh, le travail euh, pour euh, atteindre plus euh, ensemble. Euh, mon nom est Stéphane Junkert, euh, je travaille euh, avec euh, l'Institut international du développement durable euh, qui est basé euh, à Winnipeg, euh, puis je travaille avec une euh, équipe qui euh, um, uh, aide à plusieurs villes euh, déjà à um, développer des outils euh, pour mesurer euh, le progrès vers euh, Uh, les priorités locales des ODD. Uh, puis uh, nous avons un uh, panel uh, fantastique uh, qui va uh, commencer à, à raconter un peu leurs expériences uh, dans quelques minutes. Uh, mais juste avant, uh, uh, quelques petits ra rappels. Uh, comme vous l'avez peut-être vu uh, cette ma uh, ce matin, uh, um, nous avons changé un peu le format des sessions. Uh, nous avons une, toute une heure uh, jusqu'à une heure pour um, uh, discuter aujourd'hui. Uh, puis uh, pendant la session, uh, um, si vous avez des questions pour des panélistes, uh, s'il vous plaît, utilisez la boîte uh, uh, question and answer pour uh, les mettre et je vais um, voir, uh, poser ces questions-là aux, uh, aux membres du panel. Uh, si vous, vous avez des commentaires ou vous voulez discuter avec d'autres participants, utilisez le, le chat. Um, alors, um, aujourd'hui, nous sommes très chanceux que nous avons avec nous uh, le maire de la ville de Winnipeg, uh, M. Brian Bauman. Uh, qui va uh, commencer dans un instant. Uh, après, uh, il va être suivi par uh, Daniel Forger, uh, uh, qui uh, est avec l'Université de Laval, qui va parler un peu de l'expérience uh, de la ville de Québec uh, en utilisant les, les ODD. Uh, après, uh, Anna-Marie uh, Cipriani, um, uh, qui travaille avec la, um, le, le Bureau de développement durable à Waterloo, um, va prendre le, 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 le bonnet. Et euh, elle va être suivie par euh, Essa Ahmad, euh, qui travaille avec euh, euh, Green Beacon, ou qui est le fondateur de Green Beacon, euh, une organisation qui euh, supporte, euh, donne du support aux, aux organismes euh, locaux euh, dans euh, le développement durable. Et euh, le dernier va être Luis Patricio, euh, euh, qui, euh, euh, qui travaille avec le London Poverty Research Center. Euh, alors, euh, une très belle diversité d'expériences. De, euh, de, de, Um, hello, um, yeah, I'm going to continue in English. Uh, so we have a fantastic panel. Um, so I will just uh, say very, uh, three very quick things uh, about localizing the SDGs. Um, what does it mean? Well, localizing the SDGs basically is the process by which uh, the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda put down roots. Uh, it's the way that we create the foundation for a bottom-up implementation. And of course, uh, it is um, engaging the governments uh, and the organizations working at the level that is closest to the people. So the ones that really know what the needs of people are. Um, and it does provide also a way of using the SDGs to um, communicate what's happening at the local level to a broader audience to say, you know, how does what we do in order to improve our well-being, our sustainable development, how does it contribute to uh, shared global goals? Uh, the second thing is, of course, that when uh, cities engage in that, that measurement is key. We need a good structure to find uh, out where we are at, uh, to find out where we want to go, right? So uh, uh, good indicator systems, good data are key uh, to have uh, to facilitate decision making, to um, engage uh, the organizations and the partners that we want to work with, um, but also to be able to measure the success that has been achieved and share what works with other communities. And the third point thing I wanted to say, of course, um, we all know that the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic uh, is changing our baseline, right? Many, many things are um, very different from where we thought we were uh, a year ago. And uh, most communities will be challenged to change their priorities in the future to help those that are most in need. Um, but I'm very confident that the SDGs will ensure us, uh, will help us to uh, not change the vision where we want to go. So we will change our priorities in the short term, but the SDG framework and localizing the SDGs can help uh, aligning those short term priorities and helping uh, recovery with the broader vision of uh, where we want to go to form resilient communities that have more sustainable development. 
So with that, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mayor Brian Bowman. Um, Mayor, thank you so much for taking uh, a few minutes out of what must be an incredibly busy schedule these days and to talk well, about uh, a little bit uh, the experience in Winnipeg. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for having me. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's really a pleasure to, to join each of you. I know virtually these are unusual times, but uh, the work that uh, all of you I know are, are dedicated and uh, many of, of you have devoted your lives towards uh, uh, they're making a big difference right now. So I appreciate uh, having the floor. I think, Stefan, you said I can have it for an hour and a half. If you want to, <laughs> <laughs> if everybody is fine. But uh, yeah, the idea yeah. was to have uh, five minutes per speaker. And then yeah, sure. Speak. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, so as, as many of you uh, may know, uh, Winnipeg's population right now is just under 800,000. Uh, I was elected uh, Winnipeg's mayor about six years ago. And uh, at that time, we were about 698,000. Uh, we've, we've added a, a lot of people to Winnipeg. And uh, the vision that I brought to, to the mayor's office was let's, let's build a city for uh, a million people. Um, and let's do it in a way that as we get bigger, we, we, we also get better as a community and smarter as a, as a community. So in planning for a city of a million people, sustainability is, you know, is absolutely critical. In 2013, uh, the United Way, uh, with the International Institute for uh, Sustainable Development, launched the PEG website, which tracks uh, key community uh, sustainability measures here in, in our city. Uh, in 2019, uh, the PEG indicators were, were all aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And as we know, uh, what gets measured uh, gets done and um, by understanding our strengths and also our weaknesses in regards to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we can make hopefully smarter decisions to create the kind of uh, positive impacts uh, in the lives of our residents that we, we all collectively desire. Uh, we've decided to go further in aligning the City of Winnipeg's uh, guiding docu document, our Winnipeg, with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and I announced that in, in my most recent uh, State of the City address uh, to assure that as an institution, we're doing everything we can to make our city a welcoming and really a progressive place uh, for us to live, uh, to raise our families uh, and to, to grow as, as, uh, as people. Uh, what we've seen in dealing with the impacts of COVID-19, and the need for self-isolation is uh, a larger portion of our population either uh, working from home or needing to be home uh, often uh, with children or, or family members that are, are in need of assistance. Um, and I think this has brought the issue of sustainable development and livable cities to the forefront of uh, certainly public discourse and uh, supports the importance of aligning our Winnipeg with the UN Sustainable Development uh, Goals. Um, the impact of COVID-19 has really been felt in, uh, I think, every aspect of our lives. Uh, this has caused us to, uh, I think in many cases, pause and reflect on uh, what makes a city strong. Uh, what comes to mind for me is uh, affordability and efficient public and active transportation, which uh, allows us to stay connected in a responsible and a safe way um, to, uh, to each other. Um, these essential services fall in a, at really many of the sustainable development goals, uh, showing their importance uh, really as, as we continue to, to grapple with uh, the effects of COVID-19 and, and try to move our city forward as we're all working really hard to, to try to achieve. Uh, we've advanced uh, many of the new initiatives to improve transit service and affordability in Winnipeg. Uh, in the past uh, weeks, uh, the city began operation of our new Blue Line. Uh, this is a, a new rapid transit corridor, uh, the first full rapid transit corridor in our city's history, which uh, brings uh, more reliable and accessible service to residents in the southern part of our city. Uh, this area of Winnipeg is, is also connected uh, to the downtown by a new active transportation pathway running the length of the transit line. Uh, so AT uh, coupled with uh, new park and ride locations uh, is intended to encourage Winnipegers to rethink how they get around our city and really create a, a healthier um, and a better connected city 
uh, using different modes of, of transportation. The, the, the active transportation amenities are spectacular. And I think as Winnipeggers get out and see them uh, when uh, the pandemic has, um, has, has, has abided a bit, I think they're, uh, they're gonna be really impressed with, with what we've been able to build for them. Um, the health of a city also relies strongly on the health of our environment. And though there are many initiatives that we've undertaken to do our part to fight climate change, uh, the most exciting initiative for me is, is our Million Tree Challenge, where we're working with residents and businesses like uh, CN and Telpay. Uh, we're aiming to plant a million new trees by the time our community grows to a million people. So the, the branding is, we want everybody essentially to just be responsible for planting one tree. You know, a business, a resident, uh, you can donate time, you can donate money, you can actually physically plant a tree. And uh, we're telling people they can be one in a million. And uh, it's something that uh, has been really well received by uh, the community. And uh, we've got a lot of work to, to plant a million trees. Um, now to put that in perspective, for, for those of you who may not be familiar with Winnipeg, we've got about 300,000 trees on public lands. And so we're essentially looking at tripling and we need to because we, like other communities, are dealing with uh, Dutch elm disease and emerald ash borer. Um, we've got, we don't have a very biodiverse tree canopy in, in Winnipeg. And so we're, we're obviously trying to change that with the Million Tree Challenge. Uh, trees provide uh, economic and environmental benefits uh, like riverbank stabilization, uh, cleaner air, uh, natural shade, which improves the lives uh, and just the quality of lives of, of Winnipeggers. So incredibly important uh, initiative. We've also taken on the challenge of uh, better sewage treatment by upgrading uh, all of our sewage treatment plants and mitigating uh, what I think are disgusting combined sewer overflows uh, that uh, uh, pollute our rivers. And so something that all cities uh, in North America are, are grappling with and we're doing we're doing our part uh, to um, to convert combined sewer overflows to uh, uh, smarter uh, um, separate uh, you know uh, systems. Composting is another way uh, that uh, we're aiming to reduce our our footprint. Uh, in Winnipeg, uh, we're playing catch up to a lot of uh, other municipalities. Uh, we've got a, co a composting pilot project uh, which will begin this year. Uh, after decades of discussion and debate with the ultimate goal of helping to reach our waste diversion targets uh, here in, in the city. Poverty reduction is another way we're working towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, with initiatives like um, bringing in a, our first ever low-income bus pass for those that need it most in our community. Uh, we're also going to be making transit free for riders under 12 starting in 2021, reducing the financial burden of, uh, you know, on families of getting around our, our city. Um, by supporting organizations uh, like End Homelessness Winnipeg and the Downtown Winnipeg Biz, uh, they have a program called the Community Homeless Assistance Team or CHAT program. Uh, we're trying to confront the challenge of homelessness head on in our community by directly helping our most vulnerable residents. And uh, you know we're a winter city, and so that's incredibly important for the safety and well-being of, of our most vulnerable residents that are affected by homelessness. Uh, our path to reconciliation has also been uh, has also led to the creation of the Winnipeg Indigenous Accord, uh, in partnership with Indigenous leaders. Um, it's a living document that's signed by uh, by businesses, by governments like the City of Winnipeg and and individual members of council, and individuals in our community in a, really a, a, a collective and combined commitment to implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls uh, to action. In, the, in, in my view, next to climate change, how Canadians from coast to coast to coast respond or not to implementing the calls to action, I think is probably one of the greatest, uh, probably one of the greatest challenges of our generation. And I think will be measured on how we respond or not as Canadians to uh, the calls to action. So we're trying to do our part to, to be a leader in Canada. Uh, we've got amongst the largest Indigenous community in, in, uh, in Winnipeg. Uh, I'm, I'm Métis and very proud to be uh, Indigenous. And uh, we've got a lot of folks that call Winnipeg home that are Indigenous. And so 
it's incredibly important for all of our residents. Uh, we're striving to be uh, open and transparent by design as a government as well. And I wanna just chat about that for a minute. Uh, the implementation of our new community service ambassador program in response to the physical distancing requirements uh, to deal with uh, COVID-19 is really a prime example of this. These ambassadors are out in the community. They're educating Winnipeggers in our parks on physical distancing uh, obligations. Um, but we're, we're able to track the number of interactions they're having, including many of the positive interactions that they're having on our open data portal. This is available for everyone to see. Uh, and initiatives like this one, is, as one example, are important to build trust uh, with our residents and allow us to be scrutinized through the performance and that, that openness and transparency uh, with the use of concrete uh, data. So very important. Uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are an important tool in moving cities forward in uh, this new decade. And I'm, I'm very proud to have, uh, or to have them become an essential measurement tool in city planning and decision making uh, as we really all are working to make Winnipeg um, a better place to, to live, uh, to do business, and for our residents to, uh, to play in um, safely, of course. Um, with that, those are my comments. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. Thank you very much. I know you have a busy day and you've got some other speakers today. So I want to just give my best to everybody, um, wherever, wherever you are right now. I hope you're all staying healthy and safe. And if you have any questions, comments, or even criticisms of, uh, of my remarks today, um, you can reach me at Mayor Bowman at winnipeg.ca by email or just via my website at maribowman.ca. So please, uh, I know there's a lot of expertise on this call. Um, don't hesitate to reach out if you can offer some uh, constructive criticisms or comments uh, or support. I'd really appreciate that. But thanks very much. Thank you so much, Mayor Bowman. Uh, someone in the chat just said, I can see the blue line right from my house in Winnipeg. So the impact <laughs> of the work are definitely visible in data and in the real world. Yeah, yeah, with that, I'd like to give the floor to Daniel. Uh, Daniel, uh, uh, alors, uh, qu'est-ce qui, uh, qu qui se passe à Québec? Okay, see you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mayor Bowman, for the health, um, pour les conseils sur la santé. Je vais continuer en français, donc. Bonjour à tous. Hi, everyone. Je m'appelle Daniel Forger. Je suis professionnel en développement durable à l'Université Laval, à Québec, Québec. À titre de conférencier remplaçant, je suis désolé, mais je ne pourrai me prononcer sur l'intégration des ODD à la Ville de Québec. J'essaierai plutôt, en cinq ou six minutes, de vous présenter un outil, une grille de priorisation des cibles des objectifs de développement durable, la GPC-ODD. Cette grille est un fichier Excel complet développé pour l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie par la chaire en éco-conseil de l'Université du Québec à Chicoutimi, l'Institut de la francophonie en développement durable et Global Shift Institute. Oui, notre maison brûle. Nous avons des actions à entreprendre dans chacune des 169 cibles des 17 ODD. Par où commencer? La maison de nos voisins, quant à elle, est inondée. Par où vont-ils commencer? Certainement pas avec les mêmes actions et les mêmes priorités que les nôtres, mais nous avons tous deux un objectif commun, pouvoir habiter dans nos maisons respectives. Les ODD représentent cet objectif commun, ce langage commun. Sachant qu'il n'y a pas de solution unique ni de moyens infinis, tout niveau de gouvernance doit chercher à prioriser son action dans son contexte pour en maximiser les retombées. Un outil pour localiser les ODD se doit d'être intelligible, d'être simple, d'être théori théoriquement bien ancré. Il se doit aussi d'être clair dans la communication des résultats, mais surtout d'être pertinent pour l'aide à la décision. Comment maintenant utiliser l'outil GPC ODD? Il faut savoir que le gros du travail doit être effectué en amont, définir les besoins et la portée de l'étude, Prédocumenter les cibles des objectifs de développement durable selon le contexte, identifier les parties prenantes, les analystes, et coordonner les journées de consultation de ces parties prenantes. La mise en place d'un contexte consultatif favorable et représentatif exige du temps, disons deux jours minimalement, 
ainsi que la mise en place d'une éthique du dialogue et d'une horizontalité pour des échanges fructueux, pour créer des synergies et pour que les données récoltées soient de qualité. Des universitaires débarquent donc avec un cadre de référence et une méthode, alors que le contenu du rapport proviendra des parties prenantes représentant la région, le campus, la municipalité. Les participants se partagent en sous-groupe l'évaluation de chacune des cibles selon trois variables. L'importance, la performance et la compétence, qui sont évaluées selon des échelles de l'ICART allant de 1 jusqu'à 4. Un retour en plénière permet ensuite d'établir une position consensuelle du groupe sur les différentes cibles. L'importance, c'est la valeur qu'accorde la région donnée à une cible donnée. Pour la performance, est-ce que la cible est atteinte en tout ou en partie? Pour la compétence, est-elle exclusive au local jusqu'à exclusive à l'État? La mesure des deux premières variables permet de dégager une priorisation. C'est important. Mauvaise performance, ça exige une intervention prioritaire. C'est important et on a une bonne performance, ça prend une intervention de consolidation. Si ce n'est pas important et qu'on est très bon, qu'on a une bonne performance, l'intervention est non prioritaire. Et quand ce n'est pas important et qu'on a une mauvaise performance, ça se représente une intervention à long terme. Cette priorisation, couplée à la compétence, permet ensuite de faire des recommandations pour la planification locale. Par exemple, si la cible requiert une intervention prioritaire et qu'elle est de compétence locale, des interventions immédiates sont nécessaires. La cible doit être inscrite dans la planification avec des actions structurantes et ciblées. D'un autre côté, si la cible est effectivement prioritaire et que la compétence, au lieu d'être à l'État, elle est à la, au lieu d'être au local, elle est exclusive à l'État. La cible ne doit pas être inscrite dans la planification locale, mais l'État doit être informé de manière soutenue pour la prise en compte de ses besoins locaux. Pour conclure, au-delà de constituer un outil d'aide à la décision pour intégrer les ODD dans la planification locale, la GPC ODD permet quelques bénéfices marginaux non négligeables, tels que une contribution à l'acquisition de données subjectives de qualité, une intégration des parties prenantes au processus décisionnel une, et une appropriation des ODD par les parties prenantes. C'est un exercice pédagogique qui est proposé. D'ailleurs, suite à l'application de la GPC ODD dans la région de Durbel, Sénégal, avec un partenaire de l'Université Laval, l'Université Alium Job de Bambé, voici un commentaire d'un des participants. Voilà. Moi, j'entendais seulement les ODD et je n'avais pas un mot à dire là-dessus. Mais maintenant, je peux même enseigner ça. Par-dessus tout, ce qui semble avoir été le plus apprécié par les participants, c'est d'avoir ainsi pu créer un espace de dialogue. Effectivement, pendant et après l'exercice de priorisation à Bambay, les participantes et participants étaient très satisfaits d'avoir pu se parler ouvertement de corruption, du rôle des femmes, d'eau potable, d'accidents de la route, et ce, avec les mères, les griots, les sages-femmes, les étudiantes, les médecins et même les imams. Pour plus d'informations, je vous invite à me contacter. C'était Daniel Forget, The Name You Won't Forget. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Daniel. Uh, Peux-tu partager uh, ton, uh, tes coordonnées et de, le, uh, oui. uh, le lien dans le chat? Il y a des gens qui ont déjà demandé uh, plus d'informations. Parfait, je le fais. Merci. So, with that, uh, we'll go uh, to Anna-Marie. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Marie Cipriani, and to give you some context, uh, I was recently um, working on the City of Waterloo's um, strategic plan as the executive officer to the CIO, and currently I am the city's sustainability coordinator. So uh, I'd like to share three main things with you uh, in our about five minutes together. And firstly, I'd like to share with you about how the SDGs, you know, look within our municipal context. And then to kind of walk down the path of, are the SDGs a good fit? Do they add value? And can they support municipal innovation? And then I'll share some examples of localizing uh, the SDGs. So within our municipal context, I'd say there is a growing awareness about the SDGs. The University of Waterloo you know, became home to SDSN Canada in partnership with the Waterloo Global Science Initiative. 
And in 2019, the city of Waterloo began to develop a new strategic plan. And our strategic plan is a hybrid model. It means that it is both corporate and community in scope. That plan pointed us and our community in a couple new directions. And one of those pivots or new directions is equity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging. So we began the process of understanding how the SDGs could inform our work and how our work could begin to embed and align with the SDGs through our strategic plan process. I think one of the first questions a municipality may ask themselves is, are the SDGs a good fit? And so I would suggest that, you know, if you want to look at how they fit into a municipality as it currently exists, there's a lot of data and a lot of reporting that municipalities already do. So you can look at Statistics Canada, uh, the community census work that they do. Some municipalities, as we have done, have done corporate census data work. So we've worked with the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion, and we've gathered some understanding, uh, baseline understanding of our own people within our organization. Many municipalities have national water and wastewater benchmarking. Uh, they may utilize the Canadian Index of Well-Being, and we have done so recently through a Well-Being Water Region Survey. Municipalities report annually into a financial information return, and they also have conservation demand management plans. We've also begun to report in the ISO 37120 framework, which is called Sustainable Community, Indicators for City Services and Quality of Life. So in short, the SDGs can be a good fit. Second question municipalities may ask themselves is, do they add value? I'd say that the SDGs so far in my experience with localizing them, they can help to support grounding and aspirational focus. The SDGs can bring together data we already focus on, we already collect, but they add um, bringing the data together in a more holistic way. The SDGs can also provide some direction on where to pivot, why to pivot, and how to pivot. And I suggest the SDGs act as something new that can add value and may very well be at the heart of municipal innovation. So I'd like to share with you now an example of uh, what localizing the SDGs could look like in a municipality and what it could look like in our very own municipality. So in our strategic plan, we have a goal. One of the goals is strengthening Waterloo as a diverse and inclusive community. We have a strategic objective, and it reads, implementing strategies and tactics that strengthen the engagement of diverse and marginalized populations and all ages, and support an enhanced sense of belonging within the community. This focus within our strategic plan aligns with and can embed SDG target 5.5 ensure women's full and effective participation, and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making in political, economic, and public life. So we can look at SDG indicator 5.5.1, proportion of seats held by women in local government, and SDG indicator 5.5.2, proportion of women in managerial positions. If we look at, at a corporate scope at our organization, from the corporate census work we've done, we know there are some disproportionate outcomes from marginalized populations within our organization, which includes women in managerial positions. So if we take a community scope, we have data on our council composition, and we report this through our reporting into the ISO 37120. So this is an example of what localizing the SDGs can look like in municipalities across our country. And in summary, I'd say the SDGs are a good fit. They do add value to the work that municipalities are doing within communities. They can help guide some needed pivots and municipal innovation. Thank you very much, Anna-Marie. Uh, we'll go directly to S with Green Beacon. Great, thank you. At Green Beacon, our mission is to localize the SDGs. We have been collaborating with several organizations in localizing SDGs, including Sheridan College and the City of Waterloo. 
Localization of SDGs is a multidimensional process and is always unique to its context. Here, I would like to touch on two specific dimensions that organizations might find useful as they localize SDGs. One, aligning existing metrics to SDGs, and two, understanding and leveraging the value added to the organization through the localization process. Firstly, most organizations already have a me measurement framework in place, either developed internally or used through external certification process. Aligning the SDG indicators to the measurement framework the organization already utilizes provides it with the baseline data, which is the first step in the SDG's localization process. The idea here is to begin where the organization is and build up on it. It is also important to note that SDG localization is an iterative and continuous process. Secondly, the SDG's localization process adds value to the organization in several ways. Most organizations have strategic plans or other institutional documents that provide a vision of what the organization wants to achieve. Using the baseline data and backcasting from the future goals provides a clearer picture of organizational strengths and gaps. It is in this space where systemic and systematic change can occur to align the organization to the global goals and the most value added to the organization. Building on the earlier example of Target 5.5 and specifically looking at women in managerial position allows an organization to take a deeper dive, engage, and understand how the women in those positions experience organizational policies and culture. This engagement could lead to a root cause analysis, resulting in policies more conducive to women's advancement and retainment in the organization. An intersectional pivot can be made to SDG 10, reducing inequalities to ensure similar process is undertaken with members of other marginalized groups. A natural pivot from there is the application of SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. Looking specifically at target five, equal pay for work of equal value. As the SDG's principles are integrated in the organization through iterative and continuous process, they become part of the organization's ethos and culture. To recap, localization of SGs can be integrated within existing organizational processes and policies. A comparably easy way to do this is to align existing metrics to SG indicators. Secondly, substantial long-term value can be added to the organization through localization processes, process ensuring prosperity and profitability. The Sustainable Development Goals envision a world that does not exist yet, so it is helpful to approach the SDG's localization process with a different and new mindset and understand that in order to be a society we have never been before, we should expect to do things we have never done before. Back to you, Stefan. Yes, thank you, S, and uh, thanks for that reminder that we are all talking about the world that we want and not the world that we look at today. <laughs> So uh, there's a lot of uh, progress we can still make on that. Uh, last, um, be or before I go to Louis, I just wanted to remind everybody, if you have questions or any, any comment, please uh, use the question and answer box. We will have a bit of time for some questions to the panelists. So here's your opportunity to, to ask more. Uh, Louis, the floor is here. yours. Thanks, Stefan. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share our work and to learn from all of you. Je suis ravi d'être ici avec vous et imaginer un monde différent et meilleur and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. So I wanna talk about one thing today and that's uh, integration. For data, we use our work here in London, Ontario as an example. Um, first of all, an, an overview of the sectors um, regarding the SDGs here in, in London, Ontario. So the business sector, we have our traction, spearheading the work with the B Corp and uh, an early adopter of the SDG Action Manager, <coughs> excuse me, to private companies. And they're partnering with the Green Economy London to set sustainability targets um, for those private companies interested in, in doing so. In the academia sector, there are several groups using SDG language, and we can highlight the um, Center for Environment and Sustainability at Western, um, who is pushing for some of the high level discussion and also the internal plan uh, to use to adopt the SDGs uh, at the university. And the nonprofit sector, uh, of course, we have to mention the London Community Foundation. It's one of our main local champions. They're doing a great work with the Vital Science Report and um, Vital Science Conversation. 
and raising awareness and sharing data um, about the SDGs and for years now. And of course, this is part of the um, national strategy of the Community Foundations Canada. And also um, Pillar Nonprofit Network, which is an organization that really brings the nonprofit sector together here in London. And they're now embedding the SDGs in all that they are doing here. And finally, um, the SDGs found the municipal government here. And in fact, the mayor's office started a poverty panel about four years ago. Um, and that expanded to the, London's, uh, to the London for All initiative um, led by the United Way here. That initiative, um, after a few years, wanted to look into a more holistic uh, framework, more than just the social aspects of it, but also the economic and the environmental aspects of it. Um, and um, then they decided to adopt the SDGs. So for this, during our localization pro process, we wanted to use the SDGs indicator that really were meaningful in a, in a local level. Um, we engaged with many groups throughout the city, but also different departments in the city, including economic development, creeks and watersheds, strategic planning, inclusion and equity. And they were all very receptive um, to the idea of using and, and learning more about the SDGs. But it was clear that each department had very different levels of awareness about the uh, sustainable development goals. And now we have a few city staff willing to be the champions within uh, city's administration. So I, I, was, I was very glad to hear uh, Mayor Bauman speak about the importance, importance of adopting the SDGs and also Anne-Marie with um, her example from Waterloo. And um, it's obvious from our work that there's a lot of things, a lot of work going on in our city. Um, and I bet that this is the case for most, if not all of the cities here in Canada. Um, but then the question is, why do you still have so many challenges? And um, even now that uh, with the pandemic, we're even exposing more of those challenges in all aspects of our lives. So the key word, like I said, is integration. And the question is not how to do more. It's not just about capacity. The question is really how can we do things differently? And um, that requires cross-sector, cross-industries, and interscalar collaboration. And that's how we landed in a two-way method approach um, for the work that we did. Uh, we didn't actually start it this way. We're looking at the um, systemic, systematic approach to uh, all the original SDG indicators to evaluate their re relevance in our city. And that was global to local. And then we realized we needed the local to global approach as well and then interviewing 69 community leaders to present our initial findings and ask them about their expertise. And um, we also analyzed all the high level documents talking about the SDGs and interactions and interconnections. But we also looked at 13 local documents with strategies and action plans that are being used already in our city. And throughout this process, we are raising awareness and learning at the same time. So as we are educating about this international framework, we're also trying to understand better the local, local challenges here in London, Ontario. So uh, from, what, from the point that we are right now, we see that the SDGs can really become this shared language. And I think some of the other um, presenters spoke to that as well. Uh, it's really a language that is shared across areas, education, health, uh, economic development, environment, and social justice, and many others. Uh, a language across sectors for private, public, and nonprofits, and also interscholar uh, for the municipal level, regional, uh, provincial, federal, and even international level. So integration. Imagine if the city is a strategic plan, the funding decision-making process, the impact measurements of all nonprofits, and also the end-of-the-year targets of private companies. Imagine if they are all aligned using the same framework. And because of that, it's easier to start seeing those connections, those opportunities to really work and collaborate. Um, and that's uh, what we're really working towards. And if you, I, um, five minutes is not a lot of time. I did include some more information about our report on the repository for, um, I guess, all attendees will have access to that information. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have for me. Thank you very much, Stefan.
Thank you, Luis, and uh, thanks for being uh, brief as everybody else uh, for uh, sharing uh, some, some really great insights uh, that leaves us a bit of time for discussion. Uh, I've seen there's quite a lot of questions that have come in. Um, I, maybe I'll, I'll start with the, the first two questions because they're kind of related. Um, one question um, is, uh, or it starts with a comment, community consultations are not new for cities and municipalities and is a great mechanism to assist in creating more resilient communities. What are some strategies you have seen being used that bring voices to the table and that are typically not there, uh, like youth, racialized communities, or persons with disabilities. And then maybe related to that, a question was, uh, how, how do local NGOs work best with the municipality to localize the SDGs? So two, two questions focusing on engagement and inclusivity. I, I don't know exactly how this uh, worked in other municipalities, but I think in our case in London, we had a, a, a interesting uh, start like I mentioned, we started with the London for All initiative, which was really a project that started as a panel from the mayor's office. But then who led that initiative was um, the United Way here in London. And um, they really uh, strived to include all those voices. And um, because we started the process of localizing the SDGs with that group, um, uh, we had a, an opportunity to uh, start with those um, minorities and more vulnerable populations. And then we, our approach is to really ask those groups who, who is missing, who is not on the table that we, are, uh, that we should include. And that's how we got to those 69 um, interviews. We're really looking at who are the important stakeholders uh, in the, in, for all this conversation, but also um, to hear from those groups who they think should be on the table. And of course, I, I, I admit that we could do a better work, um, but there's always, you know, we, we always have these limits in, in, in time and resources and people and willingness to be part of the conversation. So I think one, one important aspect of it is as you raise awareness in those different sectors, in the private companies and the government and nonprofits, to not only to ask for their opinion or to understand more about the localization process, but that, like I said, the two-way approach to really convey the importance of having this framework. And if it, they can understand how having the shared language could be beneficial to all of us, I think it, it's a step further to bring those people in the table that sometimes are not that comfortable in, in, in joining the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Louis. And I can, I can, uh... I can second that, that uh, awareness really is the first step. I mean, in Winnipeg, we've also been working with the United Way and uh, we've gone through a, a prolonged uh, a consultative process to identify the indicators that we wanted to use. And uh, uh, a big step forward has been um, the uh, activities that the United Ways around the world are actually doing with uh, employee engagement because that opened a new uh, way for, for business to engage with the SDGs that they might have not been aware of before. So, so that's uh, one of the, the ways to do that. Um, yeah, anybody else would like to comment on that question of engagement? Anna Maria. I think, you know, it, uh, it's, it's a good question. I think one of the areas for municipalities and, and other organizations, certainly, is to look at who, who populates organizations and who is leading the consultation. So having, when, when we look at the census data we did as an organization through the um, Center for uh, Diversity and Inclusivity, um, we realized we're at the fifth um, municipal organization to do a census within our organization. So it isn't something I, I don't think broadly that municipalities understand who uh, does, you know, populate the staff complement. And so I think that's an important uh, first point, particularly as we um, lead consultation or engage consultants to do that work on our behalf. Uh, it's really important that there is a diversity uh, at the table uh, and that there is that we can bring that lens to the work. So I think that's one of the places that's beginning to wake up slowly within um, municipalities and will no doubt benefit how we engage uh, because otherwise, you know, it's, it's talking to ourselves in our silo. You know, we only know um, our, own, our own experience. And for most of us, particularly, you know, within professional realm, within the organization, it's, there's so many barriers to entry within those professional disciplines as well. It's something to really be, um, I think, mindful of and to wake up within, within our communities. Yes, thanks. Uh, Danielle or S, uh, 
Would you like to share any insights on those questions? Yeah, well, I, je vais essayer de dire en français. Uh, je crois que ce qui est important pour arriver à engager euh, ces, ces populations marginalisées-là dans, dans le processus, c'est qu'ils qu y croient, qu'ils qu qu sachent que, voyons, qu'ils savent que au, au bout du compte, leurs voix vont être entendues et que ce n'est pas worthless, ce n'est pas inutile d'être présent pour eux. La, la direction de la ville ou de, 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 de la région, du campus, peu importe, doit se prêter au jeu de l'humilité et doit être prêt à écouter et à donner un véritable pouvoir consultatif à, 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 cette, à, à, à cet exercice-là qui est fait de prioriser les ODD avec ces, euh, les différentes parties prenantes, particulièrement les gens démunis et les gens non représentés. Oui, oui c'est uh, vrai, c'est vraiment uh, important. Uh, Est-ce que vous avez des commentaires sur cette question? Um, yes, so I would like to add two things to this. Um, one, the logistical piece. I think it's really important when we are working with uh, marginalized communities to physically go to them instead of asking them to come to us. Um, I think that gesture holds a lot of value. And then um, secondly, it's the idea of um, what Daniel said about um, sharing power, but also Um, showing through actions and developing strong relationships beforehand. So before we ask them to participate, um, it is advisable to have uh, relationships of where trust has already been built in order to ensure that the participation is sincere on both sides. So reciprocal and equal relationship. Over to you. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll read out uh, two more questions that have been um, sort of voted up uh, on, the, on the question and answer here. Um, so, uh, uh, one is, uh, what, what have been the gaps that you've been seeing when you're localizing the SDGs? W which are the SDGs that have typically not been uh, included in existing plans uh, and, and strategies at the local level? And then maybe again, uh, somewhat related, um, there are some inherent trade-offs between the SDGs. When, when you do one, sometimes uh, you have to be careful that it doesn't come at the cost of implementing another SDGs. Um, what's your experience in that? Can you speak to some of those trade-offs? Maybe we can again start with Louis and use the same order. Yeah, okay. Um, I, this is actually one of the documents that I, I put in the repository. We found um, a list of, um, I guess we can say gaps or focus areas that we can be more, um, give more attention, especially in a Canadian context. Um, and I'll just pull the document here. And one, for example, a very obvious one is the LGBTQ2 plus um, communities and um, the, the discussion about uh, gender equality and reducing inequalities, it's, it's pretty much about the male and female binary uh, gender. And we definitely wanted to include um, non-binary gender discussion in, in the indica local indicators here in London. And I think this is relevant not only for our city, but to any city in Canada and, and in many other countries. Um, a few other indicators, um, For sure, reconciliation, we want to give a, a bigger emphasis to that. Uh, urban agriculture, uh, especially now, there's a, a lot of discussion with uh, about food shortages and um, migrant workers and um, urban agriculture is definitely, we have a few uh, strong local groups here, Urban Roots and, and um, other movements. Um, um, mental health is another issue they want to give more emphasis. Um, cycling and active transportation in cities. Um, and I, I shared some of those documents also in our Twitter earlier today. Uh, cycling can uh, uh, affect positively at least 12 of the SDGs. So it's definitely one thing that we want to highlight. And then the other ones are wealth inequality and um, finite resources. The um, uh, acknowledgement that we are, we, we can, continue on this constant growth uh, trajectory. Over to you, Stefan. Uh, yes, uh, Daniel. Oui, euh, les, euh, les gaps. Donc, euh, un des principaux euh, fossés que je vous dirais que j'ai vécu en utilisant la, de, en faisant de tels exercices, exercices de consultation, j'ai l'impression qu'il faut euh, vraiment contenir le consultant à son rôle de consultant. Il n'est pas celui qui priorise, il n'est pas celui qui, euh, 
qui fournit les données. Il ne connaît pas le contexte. Le contexte vient des parties prenantes. Quand j'ai été au Sénégal, je ne m'attendais pas à ce que les consensus se fassent autour des questions qui ont été consensuelles. Une des, une des pistes urgentes à, à agir au plus vite était de réduire les accidents de la route. Moi, avec mon œil d'étranger puis de consultant étranger, j'étais certain que c'était la, la faim, la pauvreté, euh, l'éducation. C'est tous des problèmes criants, mais non, eux, les accidents de la route. Donc, il faut vraiment essayer d'éviter de, de parler à leur place et de s'assurer qu'on fasse le projet avec eux et non pas pour eux. I think in terms of um, you know, questions of some, some of the gaps, um, there, are, there are things within our scrap plan, as an example, that may not be represented in the SDG. So it's an, another kind of spin on the question, perhaps. Um, we have a theme of looking at older adults, and that isn't necessarily represented in the SDG. And uh, focusing specifically on mode shift, um, we want to focus on mode shift, getting folks out of their simply occupied vehicles, And, and that focus specifically may not be you know, represented in the SDGs. Within organizations, uh, in, in general, I think if, if there's something, we want to call it falling through the cracks, I think might have been the language. Um, I think you know, SDG 1, 5, and 10, so poverty, gender equality, and a reduction of inequalities. Um, you know, if there's a bit of a trade-off, I think traditionally we focus on infrastructure, so bricks and mortar. And, um, and to some extent, not on the social aspect of, of, of life. Uh, and we minimize the value and skill sets of, of uh, the needs in the community and the social realm and have a place higher priority on more of the bricks and mortar. So when we look at, um, you know, like inequality and, and poverty, we particularly in Waterloo could look at our community and say, we are so wealthy, you know, there is no poverty, this is not a priority. And I think that that's, In, in general sense, what we've seen for many years, that's part of the shift of what's starting to wake up in our community. Um, and, and so I think that that is you know, some of those things that have traditionally not been at the forefront of discussions in our community. And the SDGs, I think it particularly can be one of those pivots that, that helps to, to enable a pivot in the discourse within the community. Yes, thanks, Anna-Marie. Uh, there was actually a specific question to you on uh, how, many, how many SDGs does Waterloo track? So I can't answer that question yet. We're still in the process okay. of, of really mapping and, and maybe, uh, maybe S will you know, have a number. Um, so S and I from Green Beacon have been really engaged in this process of, of you know, what does localizing in Waterloo look like? So there are a few things. There's lower tier and upper tier. So we're a two tier municipality. So Waterloo is, is really the first community starting uh, ahead of you know, any, any work not happening because of the pandemic to look at the SDGs. We will then begin to do the work across our entire region. So that will look at both lower tier and upper tier, which will um, you know, enable some aspects of the SDGs that is not within a, a lower tier uh, municipality. So it'll be a question that'll be interesting to answer in the future. And also uh, how we would prioritize some areas or some SDGs over others if we would do that, how we would do that, why we would do that. Um, so I think that that will be still to come. And I would say probably you know by the end of the year, I'll be able to answer that um, more succinctly in terms of if there is a number. I don't see any uh, of the SDGs off the table. Education, however, is, is not typically one within the municipal scope. You do pay your municipal taxes, there's a portion that goes to the school board, but We don't really have a scope or mandate over um, public education or, or educating community. So that, you know, there, there are some that may not align that well and may therefore not be something that falls within our scope. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe just before we go back to, to S, I'm, I'm just going to add one more uh, question that was here in the, in the chat. Or actually, there are two outstanding questions, but we, we only have uh, maybe time for one. One was, um, are, are your cities thinking about doing voluntary local reviews uh, as one of the tools that cities can use to report their progress back to, uh, to the United Nations High Level Political Forum. Uh, and then the other question, um, how can COVID-19 be used as an opportunity to actually domesticate SDGs in your communities? Uh, and have you already some examples of what you might be, uh, be doing there? Uh, we do have to wrap up in, uh, in, in about two minutes, so uh, uh, maybe just one quick round and we'll start with S. Um, thank you. So going back to the earlier questions about um, trade-offs uh, between SDGs, the, the 
the biggest trade-off that I have seen in my work is uh, with SG, SG12, responsible consumption and production. Uh, it seems to be the one that gets sacrificed um, in favor of other SGs uh, when localizing. Um, and talking about um, gaps within the process, so uh, we should always be mindful that uh, localization of SDGs is a iterative process. So when the, the gaps will appear and it's a continuous process. So as the gaps appear, they do get uh, addressed, but it's okay to have gaps in every iteration of the process. Um, regarding the post-pandemic recovery, um, SDGs actually provide a, a really great framework um, to, ha to, um, to have a resilient and inclusive recovery. And as we are changing things and we're looking at things um, in a new light, it, it's, this is actually a great time to localize SDGs and think of SDGs um, in the resilient and inclusive recovery process. Back to you. Thanks, uh, Daniel. Uh, si uh, quelque chose avec le coronavirus, uh, your par rapport aux objectifs de développement durable et à tout ce qu'on doit faire pour la transition écologique, il a amené la claire euh, démonstration qu'on est capable de changer de comportement rapidement, qu'on est capable, quand ça nous concerne directement, quand la santé publique, quand, quand je suis menacé moi-même et mes proches, je change des comportements. Donc, il y a des leçons à tirer par rapport à ce qu'on a vécu avec le coronavirus. L'une des choses à retenir, c'est qu'il n'y a pas meilleur levier pour changer un comportement que s'attaquer à la santé individuelle des gens. C'est par là que ça passe et c'est la santé individuelle directe. Pas le fait que tu as le diabète et que peut-être que tu vas avoir le cancer plus tard. Non. Uh, clear and live, threat to your life. C'est ça qui amène les gens à changer drastiquement. Ce n'est pas nécessairement non plus un changement progressif qu'on a vu. C'est un changement, une coupure drastique qui, a été, euh, qui est arrivée. C'est la théorie du, ma, euh, du mur versus la théorie des petits pas qu'on qu voit comme démonstration. Uh, merci, Daniel. Je, je viens de... Uh, I was just told that the translator had to leave already since we're getting up to the hour. So ah! I'm <laughs> repeat that, uh, yeah, what you, what you were saying is that it, it, uh, the, the COVID crisis shows how Uh, a drastic change in life, a drastic shock can change uh, behavior rapidly and, uh, and that that may be something that we might want to think about about other problems. As and well. also to link, to, to link uh, our, all our uh, activities, our, 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 yeah, all our uh, actions with sustainable, uh, with health as a sustainable way to live on our planet, one healthy planet with healthy people on, on it. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, Anna-Marie, one minute. Sure. So, yes to the VLR. So, the City of Waterloo, um, we've been working with Green Beacon and, uh, and WGSI. We will continue once we have more clearance uh, with WGSI to do the VLR across our community. So, that's, that's underway. And in terms of uh, the resiliency question, um, I would say, you know, municipalities have been hit really hard. We can't run a deficit in our budgets, unlike other layers of government. Uh, we have no sources of revenue right now. At least they've been hit. Taxes have been deferred. So we need to build capacity within these organizations to be able to see the value in the SDGs. And a VLR, as an example, helps to build capacity to meet the demands of understanding and finding our ways in localizing the SDGs. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. We're uh, exactly at one o'clock, so we will have to wrap up now, but this has been a fantastic panel and a great discussion. So thank you, everybody. Thanks to the panelists and thanks to everybody for your great questions. And uh, hopefully we can continue this discussion someone, somewhere else soon. Thank you and uh, enjoy the rest thank of you. the Together 2020 conference.